If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up the diet rule book, well, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi, everyone. It's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host for this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. So let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion and respect for all bodies. Let's shake things up and let's change the game. Body kindness makes a great gift. I always imagine when I was writing the book and watching it come together with the beautiful colors and spiral ups and reflections, that this would be the kind of book that a reader would give to somebody else and say, you know, I found some things really helpful in here and I thought you might like it too. So if that sounds like you as you're starting to put together your plans for the gift-giving season, um, whether it's going to be folks you'll see over Thanksgiving or as the holidays approach, I did want to make sure you knew how you could get a signed copy from me. So this is for a limited time. And while supplies last, you can visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order and find out how you can get one or more copies personalized and shipped anywhere in the US. Now, if you're listening outside of the US or you want to send a gift outside of the US, just shoot me an email and we'll figure out how to work out the logistics. So that's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. And don't forget, Body Kindness is coming to your ears through audiobook. Um, It's on December 25th, and we are about to enter the pre-sale. So what you're going to want to do for that is visit bodykindnessbook.com slash pre-sale, and that's where you'll get information on the perks and bonuses that I'm offering that you can't get anywhere else if you go ahead and pick up the audiobook as part of the pre-sale offer. It, this is all driven by this really broader sociocultural stigma associated with being a fat person. It has all. It comes with all of these negative stereotypes. It comes with all of these negative implications in terms of your social relationships. You know your dating prospects. It cuts across sectors and across domains. And we teach kids this very early on. We teach kids very early on that being fat is going to be associated with a host of negative outcomes. And so, of course, it's not terribly shocking that that's something that they fear and that's something that they would engage in these really unhealthy weight control behaviors to avoid. This is something that we have sort of pivoted to recently in our work is looking at, you know, stigma avoidance. How, what are the, and because, like you said, we teach Our kids, in in particular, we teach young girls, but that shouldn't be glossing over the fact that young boys also feel these fears and feel these concerns as well. But in the media, at least, we teach young girls that the, the biggest thing that they should fear is being fat. And that instills in them this motivation to avoid stigma, the stigma associated with being fat at all costs. That was Dr. Jeffrey Hunger. Jeffrey is a postdoctoral scholar in health psychology at UCLA. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Minnesota, master's degree in psychological research from CSU Fullerton, and PhD in psychological and brain sciences from UC Santa Barbara. As a social and health psychologist, Dr. Hunger is interested in using insights from psychology to understand and ultimately improve the health health of stigmatized groups, such as heavier individuals, racial and sexual minorities. Dr. Hunger's research is published in top outlets across psychology, public health, and medicine, and has been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, NPR, and more. We had such an interesting conversation. I'm so excited to share it with you. This is going to be part of a short series that I'm doing where I look research and weight stigma, and it's really only scratching the surface. I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert because one of the most important things he said in the show was at the end when I asked him about where 
weight stigma research needs to go. And he is calling for the need to research, uh, the need for research on weight stigma and body image and health to be more intersectional. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. In fact, there's, you know, there's just so much growth that we need to do in, in the same way in which the fields of medicine and dietetics needs to examine how uh, the societal views of people and the assumptions we make um, of people based on their weight is harmful and that stigma itself is harmful to our health. All that work also needs to be done in research areas as well. And literally happening as I'm recording this show open, I was engaging in a Twitter conversation with Dr. Kevin Hall, and I read his research. I respect uh, the work that he does at the NIH. And he is involved in in weight science and, and in weight management science, and you know, which is about weight loss. And, you know, it's just a such a tough situation because I don't believe that we as individuals are out there trying to harm others, you know, trying to say, I want to create stigma for people. But it's how we become aware of the systemic ways in which we are just predisposed and taught that something that is actually stigmatizing is about health and well-being and it is normal. So I could not be more excited to give you this conversation with Dr. Hunger, uh, where we discuss how weight stigma impacts mental and physical health, why stigmatizing weight should never be used as a health promotion tool, and you know just how we can get away from a focus on weight and public health and medicine and instead shift toward health behaviors. Uh, so that's a lot to unpack in this conversation, but you'll get bits from that. And um, I hope you really get benefit out of uh, listening to the series of guests that I have come on where we talk about where we're at um, with weight science and and in particular, what we know about weight stigma and, and what we need to learn. Jeff, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. And I'm. thank you for being here. I'm so, so excited to have you here and kicking off this series that I'm doing about research because Ooh. as a clinician, I have to say we it's a matter of ethics to practice from an evidence base, but also research ends up in our headlines and it could be, it can influence what we do as a culture. And I absolutely love the work that you are doing in research. And so I'm so glad you accepted the invitation to come on and share that with the listeners. Oh, thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. I'm excited to talk about all these things with your listeners. Well, just start us off, like, let the listeners know a little bit more about who you are and what you do and the type of work that you're, in, that you're interested in. We'll take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I am right now, I'm a researcher in the health psychology area at UCLA, okay. uh, where I study the health effects of stigma and discrimination very broadly. Uh, over the past ooh, five or six years now, I've really had a focus on weight stigma in particular. So looking at how experiencing or anticipating weight stigma can sort of influence our mental and physical health. Hmm. How did you get interested in that? Yeah, so it's it's an interesting story. So I started out not having any interests in health, not having any interests in weight. I started out very much being someone that was interested in the self and identity and all of these things and how we manage how people perceive us. And years ago now, I mean, probably about a decade ago now, I started managing Tracy Mann's uh, health psychology lab at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so she was doing a lot of this really awesome work on, you know, social and environmental influences on eating. Mm -hmm. And it hit me that there should just be this clear and natural sort of marriage between the stuff that I was interested in with respect to identity and the self and all of this stuff about eating. And that sort of came together for me in this interest in, you know, what are the consequences of thinking about or experiencing weight stigma for all sorts of health outcomes? Mm -hmm. Did you evolve into studying weight stigma in particular through, through seeing the connection between how we identify 
through like our connection to food. And then eventually it came into weight stigma just through. No, actually what happened was I came across this idea of stereotype threat. Mm -hmm. And there was this idea within social psychology that all you need to do is remind people about the stereotypes associated with their group. And it actually makes them end up confirming those stereotypes because they're so worried and so concerned about confirming those stereotypes that they end up doing it. Mm -hmm. So the the traditional stereotype threat work has been, for example, with women in math. So there's this prevail, you know, there's this pervasive stereotype that women, you know, underperform compared to men at math. And if you simply remind them of that stereotype, women actually do worse on math tasks. Mm. They perform, they perform worse on math tests, on the GRE, on the SAT, what have you. And I read this paper and, you know, this is back in 2008. And I was like blown away by this concept of how just simply reminding people about their stereotypes could actually undermine their behavior or alter their behavior. And so I thought about that within the context of weight and stereotypes about eating. Mm -hmm. And this stereotype that higher body weight individuals select poor, uh, poor quality foods or eat more food or exercise less. And it's sort of that was the bridge that got me. Even if the person themselves rejects the stereotype, mm-hmm. just the fact that the societal stereotype exists and is so pervasive. We see it in our media. We see it in our news. We see it in our education systems. Mm-hmm. You know, just the fact that that stereotype is so pervasive can sort of have an effect regardless of whether or not the person themselves believes in or endorses that stereotype, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough because it's when we think of our sense of agency and what we, what we do have control over, right? Like you, I mean, even if somebody is working to edit their social media feed and decide who they want to invite as friends or close connections in their lives because they don't want to have people who are going to uphold weight bias in their friendship or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. There's this issue of needing to contend with cultural stereotypes or societal stereotypes that are are going to force themselves on you regardless of the ways in which you act as an individual, which is always going to be challenging. We want to, we want to be able to have, like you say, we want to have agency. Mm-hmm. We want to have agency over your individual behaviors and agency over the communities that you create around you. Mm-hmm. And oh, the, the issue is that all of this is going to be impeded if we don't act as a culture and as a society to change these more dominant stereotypes and these more dominant assumptions. Because it's always going to be the the, the notion that these dominant ideas about uh, higher body weight individuals, these stereotypes are going to sort of trickle down and impart their sort of biases into everything that we do below them. Right. Right. And that is a lot of work and difficult work, but it's, it's work that needs to be done. And it is done as an individual and in your families and in your communities. And just even that, I remember that time where I was like, okay, so wait a minute. I... I'm doing a lot of blame of myself or looking at like, quote, individual responsibility, right? And then it's just like, Mm -hmm. but really, there's just systemic issues going on. And that's not, I still think people are still waking up to those ideas that beauty is a cultural construct and size and health is a cultural construct. And like all that they're created, not anything that we can go back on based on evidence, but it's just like, this is, this is what was said. This is what was determined. And so this is what we're going to try to conform to. Absolutely. We're dealing, we're pushing up against very hardened ideas. Like you say, these ideas of say weight and health, Mm -hmm. it's incredibly difficult to push back against the idea that higher body weight individuals are not inherently unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And I know you've talked about this and your guests have talked about this extensively, but this is a a, a big challenge that we have to push up against is this idea that you can actually be healthy and be heavier. And the flip side of this, which I think is often overlooked, Mm -hmm. is this idea that we, the normative model of thin people being healthy is not helping the 30 to 40% of thin people that are at severe cardiometabolic risk. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're we're not only continuing to, you know, perpetuate the stigma associated with higher body weight individuals by saying that, you know, they have to be unhealthy. They have to conform to all these stereotypes, 
But then we're also telling these thinner individuals that you're perfectly fine, yeah. that you should, you're probably healthy because your BMI is within this range that, you know, some committee of the task force has determined it is appropriate when within that category, we're still thinking about 30 to 40% of those people as being unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And then this whole other uh, idea about beauty, this idea about beauty across the weight spectrum. I think one of the, one of the criticisms that I have for this notion is also that beauty doesn't necessarily need to be the marker that we should be judging ourselves on. That's one of the issues that I have with some of these sort of social media campaigns about talking about everybody is beautiful. Everybody is beautiful. They're generally gendered. Mm -hmm. These, these approaches are, are, are geared towards women and they're trying to tell all women that they're beautiful. And so all that does, although, you know, it it has this mask of being a body positive sort of affirming approach. But what this does is this continues to yoke women's worth to beauty Mm -hmm. and to what they can convey to other people, as opposed to the whole host of other things that we can think about in terms of the ways in which women contribute to our society and advance our society in terms of their skills, in terms of their employment, in terms of their intellect. And so it's a really interesting to even try to challenge the beauty notion within our own community, your and I community of trying to be body positive, Mm -hmm. but not, not necessarily resting on, you know, beauty and physical appearance as being the be all end all in terms of what makes someone worthy or not. Yeah. Even as we see these things evolving, We also have to go back and question of, okay, well, let's see more higher weight people in bikinis. Let's see more uh, people of color or more different abilities. And so we could see more diversity there. But at the end of the day, we're all still posing in our bikinis. And so that becomes the next layer that we need to dismantle. Absolutely. But you also touched on what I think is a really important comment or a really important point about the BOPO perspective, the body positivity perspective. It's losing its roots in fat positivity. Okay. And, you know, body positivity came out of the fat acceptance movement. And it, it came out of fat positivity. And just across the board, body positivity runs the risk of erasing embracing and supporting fat people and fat positivity by, like you say, treating these issues of these, you know, thinner bodied people rolling a little bit to get a little bit of a role to show that they too are, you know, imperfect, but it's, it's, it's walking this very fine line. I feel like the, the body positivity movement right now is walking this very fine line of uh, fat erasure Mm. because it's dealing, it's become such a a commodified, to be honest, Mm -hmm. but such a broad construct and and, an idea, especially in social media, that it it sort of is losing its roots, that it's not supposed to just necessarily be everybody should love their bodies, which everybody should. I'm not ever telling anybody that they shouldn't love their bodies. Mm -hmm. But it should be and always has been historically about embracing and supporting oppressed fat bodies. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm, one of the things that I'm worried about is the body positivity movement. If it continues in this track is becoming something of an all lives matter version Mm -hmm. of the black lives matter movement. Right. You know, the, the, the criticism of the black lives matter movement from the all lives matter people is that there's this incessant focus on one specific subgroup. And it's never been that, it's only black lives that matter. But in this specific instance, in this time, in this uh, sort of social environment that we have, these are important people that we need to lift up and support. And at the same time, we might be losing that in the body positivity movement if we don't continue to embrace fat positivity as opposed to just take the all bodies matter approach of the the blanket body positivity. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you 100%. And it's I can tell in my face I'm getting the fire is coming like I'm getting angrier <laughs> because it just automatically directs me to 
And this is why it sucks in the medical community because they are one of the biggest perpetrators of weight stigma. And I mean, it makes sense that in America that we have the ability to care about our health and well-being. Like that, it makes sense that that's something that we care about. And so you go down the line of health and well-being and you go down the line of of doctors and healthcare, and it's full of stigma, riddled with stigma. And to your point about the disparity about how just making an assumption about health based on weight it excludes people who are actually conformed to the thin ideal based on BMI and they're not healthy. It's built into their education and it's built into the system of, okay, I have a patient, they get weighed before they even come and see me. And oh, if the BMI triggers, then I'll refer to them to intensive behavioral counseling without running labs, without asking questions about their behavioral patterns or without even checking in to see Is knowing this person's weight a good thing for them right now in this moment? And how do I know? And the second, I mean, they'll even do it to little kids. They will say, a pediatrician will say to a little kid directly or with a little kid in the room, well, there's some weight trend. We might be getting near puberty. Let's just make sure we don't gain any more weight and just dump that into the room. And I mean, if you're a typical American just doing your thing, you probably don't know that much about these issues and the stigma that that is putting into the room, not only for your own worry about what to do next, but even your perceptions on how you're going to treat others. Absolutely. This, uh, oof, the, the weight stigma and these weight-related conversations within the medical field are are terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, that, that could be an entire another two hours of us <laughs> ranting, I feel like. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, like you said, the first thing the first thing that you do before you even see a doctor is you get thrown on a scale. Mm-hmm. And so you instantly know that the, the primary focus of the next seven minutes that you have with your primary care provider, because we know that they are up against intense time restrictions, which isn't necessarily their fault. This is a function of a broader failed structural system of our healthcare. But these conversations are short. And so, of course, they're going to use a heuristic, a terrible heuristic like body mass index to guide their conversations. And they shouldn't be. Like this, oh, it, it makes me, it hurts me to know that these conversations are still happening in a pediatrician's room um, or in a pediatrician, pediatrician's doctor room because this is such a critical phase for these conversations to have really nasty impact when we're talking about, you know, adolescent kids hearing, even if it's not directly, like you say, even just hearing in the room, putting these conversations out that their weight is problematic, that they are too fat for their age or too fat for their height or all of these different things that come out. And it, it just, there needs to be a paradigm shift. And it's, this is like you, you said before that there's, this is sort of entrenched within the medical model of how they train doctors, but there needs to be this fundamental paradigm shift of just pulling out weight from the conversation, particularly if this is the thing that I've been, I go off on on occasion is like, particularly if you have your patients in the doctor's office, you can run labs you have all of the important information in front of you, irrespective of weight. Mm -hmm. You can look at their blood pressure. You can look at their cholesterol. You can look at their blood glucose levels. You can look at actual indicators of health because you have them in the lab and you don't need to rely on a shitty heuristic. Apologies for swearing. No, I love Uh, it. (laughs) uh, We're an explicit show. (laughs) Oh, thank God. Uh, You know, for using such a shitty proxy such as BMI. Mm -hmm. And it's a nasty heuristic and a nasty sort of turn to or a default that we need to move past. And it's been challenging to get people to accept that. Yeah. Well, and then along those lines, there is the business of medicine as well. And so whether you just look at the weight loss surgeries and drugs component, it's a significant amount of dollar value. And so there is money to be made by continuing to say obesity is a disease. There is uh, the the diet industry is you know, a giant multi-billion dollar industry Mm -hmm. that is 
predicated on it not working. Mm -hmm. Like if diets actually worked, the Mm -hmm. diet industry would be gone. Like it's not a money-making model to, to lose your clientele in 12 months. Right. Um, that's why most of the, the sort of diet industry knows this and it's, it is predicated on, of course, these fast weight loss fixes, you know, people may see a drop in weight over, you know, one or two month period, but then they're going to gain it back, if not more over time. But that's exactly what the, this broader industry wants because the broader industry is built upon having a, you know, a 50 or 60 or 70 million person swath of our country think that they are fat Mm -hmm. and that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem that needs to be fixed. And one of the quick fixes is turning to the diet industry. Mm -hmm. And they do not want people to feel comfortable in their bodies because if you feel comfortable in your body, you're no longer going to feel a motivation to lose weight. Mm -hmm. You don't need their product. (laughs) Exactly. You no longer need their product because their product serves it only serves individuals that feel that they are fat and that is an issue. Mm-hmm. You know, and one time uh, Deborah Gard compared it for me to the tobacco industry. And I was like, ooh, that is juicy to think of it like that. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, uh, I think I may have heard Deb use this this uh, analogy before that it's sort of you, basically getting people hooked on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's, and it, it actually is true. Like you... Mm-hmm. And I mean, there are analogies abound between smoking and and weight, and Mm -hmm. especially about these industries and about how they have influenced the narrative. Mm -hmm. Both the smoking industry and the diet and weight-related industry have funneled a bunch of money into lobbying to shape what we think of as healthy and unhealthy Mm -hmm. in both domains. It, It just sucks, though, because you can look at the tobacco industry and say, they make cigarettes, Joe Camel, Joe Camel is bad. But who's going to look at their doctor? Who's like the savior? This doctor saves my life, basically. Who's going to look and see danger there? They're going to see wisdom and I just need to fall in line and listen to everything they say. And, and I think there's a lot of danger in that. A hundred percent, because we're dealing with, with cigarettes, we're dealing with an industry Mm -hmm. and we, we can, you know, enact strategies to argue against the industry because they don't have they might not have the clout that we have in terms of a government saying cigarettes are bad for you. The government came out and said, listen, citizen, uh, you know, citizens, cigarettes <laughs> are bad for you. These are the health implications. We need to stop this. But when it comes to weight, this has been institutionalized. Mm. And that's the difference. The, the medical model associated with weight always equating to poor health has been institutionalized. And so that's why it's so difficult to chip away at Mm -hmm. because it's built into so many of the institutions, so many of the educational systems and so many of the trainings that all of our experts get and that we turn to as supposedly being the experts of, you know, and the arbiters to our health. If someone is at a higher weight and experiencing poor health, that there's not necessarily that causal association. And also there could be likely any number of other factors, whether it's genetics or socioeconomic status, like poverty and stress and racism, all those things would intersect to likely impact the health. So for us to just kind of make it a like a dichotomy, higher weight, bad health, I mean, that is just, that's the simplicity in what we believe, but there's so much flaw and error in that. A hundred percent. There's, to make that direct link, between higher body weight and poorer health Mm -hmm. is just so flawed on so many levels. Um, And like you said, there are so many other factors that can contribute to both being at a higher body weight and having poorer health. Mm -hmm. Um, Or in our work, we would argue that the stigma associated with being heavier actually has these negative psychological, physiological, and biological effects that could contribute to the very health effects that we normally just attribute to being fat. Mm -hmm. Can you dive into that a little bit more? Because that might be first for some of the listeners to understand. So like like the stigma itself is worse for your health than necessarily what would naturally be happening. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about, you know, higher body weight individuals, when we talk about quote unquote obese individuals, Mm -hmm. uh, there are all of these negative health effects that are associated with it. You know, it's correlated with 
higher depression. It's correlated with risk of uh, diabetes. It's correlated with risk of a, a host of cardiovascular diseases. But all of these diseases, all of these outcomes that are associated with being a heavier individual are also associated with being chronically stressed. Peter Munig has this really great paper in 2008 basically showing that all of the diseases and all of the conditions that are often correlated with weight are also correlated with individuals that are chronically stressed. Mm. And he was one of the first people to make this link, to ask this question. He didn't do it empirically. He just sort of was pulling all of this data together and looking at it and saying, well, what? If we look at this, you know, everybody that, or, you know, people that are chronically stressed have all of these diseases and people that are higher body weight have all of these diseases. And we know that there's a lot of stress associated with being heavier in this fat phobic society that we live in. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not the weight at all, but it's the social experience that elicits all of these negative processes. And that sort of kickstarted that sort of kickstarted a bunch of research over the past decade now, because that was in 2008. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've shown, uh, my, my research group and other research groups have shown that, you know, weight stigma is associated with increased inflammation. It's associated with altered health behaviors, which we know are super, super important for long-term health. So it affects your eating behaviors. It affects your physical activity. It affects your sleep. Mm -hmm. which people often overlook as being a very critical health behavior. And I'm a big proponent of getting your, your good night's sleep. And so there are all of these processes that are associated with stress that really stem from the stigma associated with being higher body weight that might just explain why being fat sometimes is associated with poor health. Yeah. And so I would love to talk more about some of the specific research that research that you've been working on over the past few years or recently. So I'm just going to start with not with any particular study, but just what what have you been involved in recently that you feel most excited about or inspired by or just But no, uh, some of the work that I've been doing more recently has been in the disorder of eating realm, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I've been interested in weight stigma for a long time. And oftentimes I've been studying it in the context of sort of normal eating behaviors. You know, how does it influence your dietary patterns across the day, for example, or how does it influence your snacking behavior? But recently I've become really interested in how experiencing and anticipating weight stigma can actually influence disordered eating. Mm -hmm. And I think that we as a country have not an epidemic of obesity or an epidemic of weight. We have an epidemic of unhealthy relationships with our body and very unhealthy relationships with food. Mm -hmm. And so I've become incredibly interested in this. And so some of my work recently has been looking at how simply being told that you're too fat by you know, your parents or by your peers or by your teachers can actually lead to greater disordered eating over time, adolescent females. And mm. so I had a paper uh, that was published recently in the Journal of Adolescent Health that was looking at this very topic. We followed 2,000 uh, girls from the ages of uh, about 15 to 19, and which is a critical sort of developmental period when it comes to weight-related and eating-related outcomes. And so we found that just being told that you are too fat by anyone in your social network, like I said, whether it be family members or peers or strangers, was associated with an increase in things like body dissatisfaction, unhealthy drive for thinness, engaging in these really nasty, unhealthy weight control behaviors such as you know binging, purging, uh, skipping meals, excessive exercise, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was four years later. This is over a four year period. Mm -hmm. So I, when I started in this area, I wasn't interested in disordered eating per se, but it's sort of something that I've become more and more excited about because I think that the work that I do as an experimental psychologist can actually really impact how we understand the processes linking weight stigma to these disordered eating outcomes. 
Yeah. I mean, this is so important because we, we actually, we like the cultural, we could look at these things and that are disordered and be like, oh yeah, that's just normal. You know, like we, we have normalized disordered eating as this is, you know, the part of the rite of passage of girlhood or young adulthood, but that is very problematic. And what, what is at least in part fueling it is the fact that one of the worst things that a young person could be is a fat person. Exactly. It, this is all driven by this really broader sociocultural stigma associated with being a fat person. Mm-hmm. It has all. It comes with all of these negative stereotypes. It comes with all of these negative implications in terms of your social relationships. You know, your dating prospects. It cuts across sectors and across domains. And we teach kids this very early on. We teach kids very early on that being fat is going to be associated with a host of negative outcomes. And so, of course, it's not terribly shocking that that's something that they fear and that's something that they would engage in these really unhealthy weight control behaviors to avoid. This is something that we've sort of pivoted to recently in our work is looking at, you know, stigma avoidance. What are the, because, like you said, we teach our kids, in, in particular, we teach young girls, but that shouldn't be glossing over the fact that young boys also feel these fears and feel these concerns as well. But in the media, at least, we teach young girls that the, the biggest thing that they should fear is being fat. Mm-hmm. And that instills in them this motivation to avoid stigma, the stigma associated with being fat at all costs. Mm-hmm. And that may start as dieting, that may start as you know a preoccupation with exercise, but that stigma is strong enough and that the uh, motivation to avoid that stigma is strong enough that that could eventually lead to these unhealthy and disordered eating behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where is that line anyway? Like, should, should we be talking about our human responsibility of helping to bring forth a generation that is equal, happy, healthy, strong to our, the best of our abilities. Like we should be questioning why even that, like, as I understand kids, especially when they're going into their teens, that there, there is a normal pattern of becoming hyper aware about your body and its changes and sort of trying to fit in. And that it's not about really trying to avoid that. Like there is a period of that, but it's what are they being given as messages while they're going through that period. And this study that you did is showing that regardless of the weight, the messages about fat being a bad thing um, led to experienced, I'm assuming also internalized weight stigma, which impacted their behaviors on some sort of spectrum of an extreme, like whether it's extreme or mild, it had an impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I I wish we had internalized weight bias because you bring up a very important topic there too. I wish we had data in this study, but we really didn't. But Mm -hmm. yeah, these, I think uh, these sociocultural conversations that we have around weight really have impacted, at least in our study, adolescents at that age when, you know, 15 is a very sensitive age Mm -hmm. and it's an age in which you, like you say, your body is rapidly changing. And so you're integrating both these rapid changes in your body, rapid changes in your psychology associated with that, and integrating that with all of these messages that you're being bombarded with from the culture, from the media, from everywhere that says this, this is the appropriate way to be a young girl, mm-hmm. or this is the appropriate way to be a young boy. And if this standard is not met, it's going to drive all of these unhealthy and just detrimental behaviors. Mm -hmm. And just even I'm reflecting on how it spreads. You know, this is personal experience, but I, I remember being nine and that's the earliest I can remember my first visceral experience with weight stigma. And just like you were saying, it was a warning, like, be careful. You might look like your mom, aunt and grandmas are cleaning up the picnic table. Um, 
And it was, and and I, I know it wasn't just one thing, but there was an early on that there was an association between adult bodies and being larger and that that was bad. And then, of course, the different magazines I read, the different sort of girl fat talk among girls that happened, like all these things. But it was like, I mean, I could set a goal of like, I'm gonna, you know, really limit my food today, like on this summer day and like just kind of drink some liquids. And what's interesting about my experience is like, I believe that biologically my body just somehow was able to fight developing into a full-blown eating disorder. But I would do these things and more get congratulated for like dedication to exercise and like positive restraint to the family cookie table or whatever. And when I look back now, just like inside the twisted thoughts I had and the, and just the pain I felt about watch, watch this, that the negative judgments when I looked in the mirror and just to get the feedback that was like remotely congratulatory is really twisted. These cultural forces and this reinforcing at every level are are so potent and so difficult to overcome. Like you say, even you know, at a, a at, at the youngest of ages, these behaviors become reinforced by our social environment. They become reinforced by our parents when we're younger. They become reinforced by our peers when we get a little older. You know, even just the simple comment of, oh, my God, you look so great. Have you lost weight? Mm -hmm. Suggests that you couldn't have looked good (laughs) at a higher weight. That somehow how good you look is yoked to your weight. And but it, w- when you get that comment in that immediate moment, because you may have lost weight or you may have changed something, mm-hmm. it does have a reinforcing value to it mm-hmm. because it says at a broader level, I'm working within this cultural stigma and I'm succeeding at it. I'm beating this cultural stigma because I'm avoiding being fat. Yeah. And it's just it's so pernicious in everything that we do. And like you say, it actually is filtered into and reinforced in the dietitian training, which is these conversations where we talk about if some of the the behaviors that we prescribe to fat people uh, were prescribed to thin people, it would be an eating disorder. But Mm -hmm. it's congratulated among higher body weight individuals because that same behavior that is somehow disordered in a thinner individual is actually solving the quote unquote issue among a fatter body. Mm -hmm. And so sort of interrogating how we think about these behaviors across the weight spectrum is super important. Yeah. There's so many things I want to ask you about. Like I was thinking about the idea of like, is, is there like a human nature psychological thing, (laughs) big words, but like, is there a thing we do on the individual level, right? Where it would look for evidence, I guess, is that confirmation bias? Is that what I'm going to about to say? It's like when we look for evidence, it's like, oh yeah, but then the doctor said this. So therefore, so we kind of end up reinforcing our beliefs since it's like we have to be right because we don't want to be wrong kind of a thing. Can, what am I talking about? <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think confirmation bias. <laughs> I, I mean, know I'm it's here, a thing, but I need I'm you here, to describe it. <laughs> I'm here to be your encyclopedia for all of psychology. It seems. Uh, no, but I think, I think confirmation bias is the closest thing to what you're, what you're talking about is because when we start from this assumption, it's very hard to find people that don't hold this assumption that – weight is yoked to health. Mm -hmm. And so anytime the doctor says that, or the news says that, or a dietitian says that, like you say, it's confirming this existing belief. Mm -hmm. And so all it's doing is strengthening uh, this, what eventually becomes an ideology. You know, it becomes something so core to who we are as an individual and so core to who we are as a sort of a society at this point that it just continually gets reinforced and gets stronger and stronger and harder and harder to break. Mm -hmm. And, but that's, and that's what I'm interested. I'm most interested in breaking that. I want to hop into the medical community or the medical model and break that. I want to just snap that link in half. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, we're trying our hardest to do this by showing, you know, that weight is not associated with health really. It's not a great predictor. And even when it is a predictor of health, 
the things that are not accounted for are things like stress, Mm -hmm. things like depression, things like weight stigma. None of these other sort of confounding factors are considered in the medical model because they want to say X causes Y. Mm -hmm. They want to stay as simple as possible. And unfortunately, social psychology doesn't like simple. (laughs) We, we, uh, we love a good question of why Mm -hmm. we want to know why. Or how, if you want to say that X causes Y, if you want to say that weight causes poor health, I'm going to need some hard evidence as to why or how. And I think I've taken that lens of being this, you know, mechanism interested social psychologist and looking at this weight literature and just trying to be like, well, no, what the hell are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. Like, you're not, you're not thinking about it properly. This is not a thing. Yeah, I know. It sometimes it feels like you're driving into a brick wall or something. It's like, ah, oh, you know, but you have to keep the energy up and keep going because it, it's definitely a long process. Um, I want to circle back just briefly with respect to the first study that you mentioned, because listeners might want to know if you have any insight or ideas or like tips to sort of avoid, I mean, I, we can't control people who are around girls if the word fat is muttered, but did your research deliver any insight or in your experience, do you have any insight, like knowing that this is a problem, what you should, what should a listener do? Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the research itself doesn't speak directly to that. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of a very simple measure of, you know, the exposure to being called fat. Mm-hmm. But I think if we're talking about parents, if we're talking about aunties, if we're talking about people around kids, mm-hmm. I think first and foremost, if parents or you know people around kids suspect that a child might have an eating disorder, have them assessed by a, a, a weight neutral specialist. But beyond that, I think that parents in these environments can really work to promote a positive body image and healthy eating behaviors in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. I have said it before and I will say it until I die. (laughs) Um, The first thing they can do is take weight out of the conversation altogether. When we are discussing health, um, particularly with children, but in general, when we're talking about health in general, let's just pull weight out of the equation. Uh, Weight does not dictate our health and most certainly does not dictate our worth. And so parents can also use that dictate and model body positivity and model good health behaviors for their kids. So like you say, they may be hearing this fat talk murmured around them, but we can quit that. We can quit the negative fat talk. We can quit the chronic dieting. We can quit the body shaming. And we can just recognize and appreciate all that your body can do for you and find eating and exercise habits that are sustainable and enjoyable and contribute to your well-being overall. And I think if we as older adults model these things and really embrace them ourselves, our kids or the younger generations can see that and sort of see a nice, clear example of what's the best way to go about it. Yeah, that or just learn from our mistakes and do better. Like if we can't oh. help you, <laughs> like look at us, us as the model of what not to do and do better than we did. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about something else. It, it was a thought that came up while you were talking earlier and it, and it had to do, and I, I, I don't know what your insight might be on this, but it had to do with, I do think that people... I think in the on on the individual sense, we'll get stuck with like things like, okay, but like, what if I do want to lose weight? Or what if I was not a runner before and I did a couch to 5k and that led to this that led to that and I did a half marathon and that led to weight loss and I also feel stronger and more this or that. I mean, we know there are statistical unicorns who may lose weight. And I don't know, I guess My question is, what would your insight be to something like that? Because it's like, I don't think we can really afford to not have everyone aligned in a sense of that we all need to work together toward fat liberation, regardless of what individuals decide to do with their bodies, do or don't. 
But I think that there'll be a person where their personal lived experiences, life wasn't so good, life got better. One of the things that helped life get better is I quit alcohol and I started running and I'm happy with my life and I lost weight, like picture, post. And it's like, what's wrong with sharing my joy? What's wrong with sharing my accomplishment? And so I do think it's a, it's an interesting thing to bring up to say, well, how would we unpack for that person who really does care about, like, I don't understand how I might be contributing to weight stigma and harm, educate me, and also just help people understand that it's, we're not saying don't, don't look at positive ha- habits that might make you feel good, you know, that, that it's, that would be like, I guess maybe like another way of conforming that, that I think is maybe people assume that if you're going to give up on dieting, that you have to give up on wanting to change your life for the better say. No, absolutely. So I would say first and foremost, I'm a feminist and I am fully in support of body autonomy. I am in no position to tell anyone about what they should or should not do about their own body. Mm-hmm. Like hard stop. Mm-hmm. That that is that is at the forefront of my position on body positivity and on weight stigma on everything. Mm-hmm. If you what you do with your body is your choice and I want to support that and I want to make sure that you're making the most informed decision in that realm. Mm-hmm. And a body positivity approach isn't necessarily an anti-weight loss approach. Mm-hmm. Like if we think about the way that like Linda Bacon and Lucy Aphr- Lucy Aphromore talk about these things is like once we get to a position where we have a healthy relationship with food and a healthy relationship with our body and a healthy relationship with, you know, physical activity, we may see changes in our weight because we may be finally engaging with what our body wants it to be. at. we may be engaging and finding our weight set point. Mm -hmm. So I think it's absolutely fine and you can lose weight and still be a body positive person. Mm -hmm. I think if that, that may just be a natural side effect that comes with changing your health behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think what becomes problematic is when just like the dominant model is now the focus is on weight loss. Mm -hmm. You know, the, if the, if the focus is I'm only engaging in health behaviors, X, Y, and Z to lose weight that's always going to be problematic. That's always going to kind of have an underlying fat phobic flavor to it. Mm -hmm. If you're saying instead, you know, I want to reconnect with food. I've had an unhealthy relationship with food. I've been relying on external cues or external rules. I haven't really been eating intuitively. I haven't been listening to, you know, hunger and satiety cues, you know, but now I really want to hop into that. And I really want to find physical activity that makes me happy and that makes me, you know, boosts my mood and that I feel is sustainable. And I'm finally going to actually commit myself to getting seven to eight hours of sleep. Yeah. If we do all of those things, yeah, you may see changes in your weight, just like you're probably going to see changes in your mood and you're going to see changes in your blood panels. Mm -hmm. All of these things are going to come along with realigning ourselves with acknowledging what our body can do for us and respecting our body and treating it in the way that it needs to be treated. I think when that focus is only on look at how thin I became and how hot I am now or all of those things where it still becomes yoked to the weight loss process itself or when these comments are subtly or sometimes not so subtly rooted in weight stigma of now I'm attractive or now I can live my life to the fullest or all of these things that still subtly suggest that there is a hierarchy among fatter and thinner bodies. Mm -hmm. If if the messages continue to maintain that hierarchy, then they're going to be problematic. But, and you know, I would want to interrogate those and push back on people and make them think a little more critically about the messages that they're putting out across their journey to health. But that does not mean that the fat positive movement or the the body positive movement is completely like anti-weight loss or anti-health. I think that's a big, and that's a big challenge that this movement is facing is Mm -hmm. there's this assumption, which again is really rooted in the stereotype that fatness equals unhealthy, that if you are fat positive, you must be Mm anti-health. Yeah, no. And I think that's right. And from what 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 I have been able to learn so far, it's this idea of that you can't fat positivity does not all elements of it does not have to include health because then it's sort of 
the good fatty phenomenon. Like as long as you're working on improving your health, yeah. then so health is not a moral imperative. Mm -hmm. Like and just we can't we can't treat health like we were talking about earlier treating beauty. Mm -hmm. as the standard on which we're supposed to judge individuals. Mm -hmm. Like that's, if, if we yoke the body positive movement to being healthy, all we're doing is shifting some sort of standard and finding a new metric on which to judge people as good or bad. Mm -hmm. And that's completely antithetical to this idea of fat liberation and fat acceptance across the spectrum. I don't give a shit if you want to or don't want to engage in health behaviors. As a health psychologist, yes, I want to promote that because that's mm -hmm. part of who I am and part of my identity. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to use the behaviors that you engage in, just like I'm not going to use your weight as a way to judge you as a person or judge your worth as a person. And it becomes a, a fine line there or a dance where people shift from wanting to use weight as a way to, to criticize people to using their health behaviors as a way to criticize people. Yeah, I feel that too. And I often find that I'm constantly wanting to like take stuff back from diet culture. So it's like, no, you can't have the vegetables. I'm allowed to like and eat vegetables. And, you know, it used to be spray butter and now it's regular butter from Europe, <laughs> you know, but it's like, no, you're not, you're not taking this away from me saying that, oh, this is, I like the challenge. There are always other reasons that you can find to do those things and know that when you are reframing habits that feel like they feel good to you right now and within what you can, what you have time to do and can afford to do, that process of letting that be enough and be good and whatever space you take up, whatever shape is there internally, having that peace with it. And kind of like how we started in the beginning, knowing that it sucks that society still may make a judgment against you and that can still have an impact, but also knowing that these are the things that I have the agency over and the control over and that I will do them because I'm not going to let you take all the power over me. Then where am I? No, absolutely. I, I hate that diet culture is so dominant that it has basically Columbus all of positive health behaviors. Mm -hmm. It has taken enjoying going to the gym or enjoying some physical activity that you find uh, helpful and sustainable, or it has Columbus its way over like a good roasted vegetable. <laughs> like, like, I love- I Give love me my good, broccoli back. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I love a good roasted vegetable. And I hate that that has been taken over and co-opted or columbus by diet culture, because that should be for everyone without- the negatives, without the ills, without the shame and the guilt that comes along with the shit that diet culture gives it. Mm -hmm. It imbues all of these wonderful behaviors that can have such a positive impact on our lives. And it just makes them dirty. It yeah. gives them a, a, a sort of a nasty angle to it. And I want us to reclaim those as much as I want us to reclaim body positivity. Mm -hmm. I want us to reclaim health behaviors as for everyone, not just people trying to lose weight. Yeah. Amen. On that note, as a researcher, where does research need to go? Like, is there a funding issue? Is there a focus of study <laughs> issue? Like what? I know there's always a funding issue in research, yes. but, um, but this is, this is the time to say like direct, direct people. What is your vision for like, this needs to be uncovered next, or this is where we need to push things study-wise because research is going to be important. Absolutely. And there, like you said, there's always a funding issue. So funding would always be fantastic. <laughs> but uh, I think, honestly, one of the biggest issues within weight stigma, within weight and health is thinking about identities from an intersectional perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the weight stigma literature and the weight literature more broadly, and I'm just as guilty of this, has not done a great job of focusing on how individuals across intersecting identities, you know, individuals across genders, individuals across races, individuals across social, uh, socioeconomic statuses and sexual orientations, how these unique social positions combine to influence the pressures that they face related to weight and weight stigma. Uh, we know that weight stigma and stigma more broadly 
is not evenly distributed across the country. It's not evenly distributed across a population. You know, these weight concerns are unique when we think about the concerns that black women face compared to white women, when we think of straight men versus uh, queer men, when we think of uh, individuals who are low SES versus individuals who are high SES. And really, we need to, as a field and as researchers, grapple with the complexities that come with these intersecting and multiple forms of identity. Yeah, I agree 100% because it's the the folks who are the most marginalized are the ones that that need the most attention and support because if you're helping them you're helping everyone else in the meantime. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I'm so glad you were able to come on and chat. How can people find and connect with you and and get in touch and all that good stuff. No, thank you so much for having me. I agree. This has been a fantastic chat. And so if your listeners want to get in touch with me, they can find more information about my work at jeffreyhunger.com. And they can also feel free to follow me at at Dr. Hunger on Twitter. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Have a good day. And that's a wrap on today's show. Let's continue the conversation on Facebook. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and click to join. And if you can contribute to the production costs for the 2018 podcast season, visit gofundme.com slash bodykindness. We love ratings and reviews. Please do that. And don't forget to let your friends know that Body Kindness is one of your can't miss podcasts. If you have questions, comments, or guest recommendations, shoot me an email, Rebecca at Body Kindness Book dot com.